Members and guests, good morning, and thank you for allowing us to present our research on the comparison of component separation technique versus no component separation technique in the repair of large ventral hernias. These are our disclosures. Ventral hernia repair remains one of the most common surgeries in the world. There are 350,000 of these procedures performed each year in the United States, and in 2017, it was the third most common procedure for graduating surgical residents. While initially debated, it is commonly accepted that primary fascial reapproximation with mesh reinforcement provides for an ideal hernia repair. The component separation technique was first described in a 1951 paper in Argentina, but was really popularized and coined by Ramirez et al. in their 1990 paper. Dr. Otero from our institution showed in 2018 that the utilization of component separation is increasing over time based on the percentage of cases of open ventral hernia repairs that utilize it. We have seen in multiple studies, including a recent systematic review, that there are increased wound complications in component separation. And we've seen in other studies that there's no difference in quality of life when it's performed. So the aim of our study was to compare the outcomes in patients receiving component separation versus those who do not in large ventral hernia repair. For our study, anterior component separation was as described by Ramirez with an external oblique release which was performed after posterior rectus sheath release. And posterior uh, was a posterior rectus sheath release with or without transversus abdominis release. This is a single institution prospective hernia database that we queried for open ventral hernia repairs. We looked at hernia recurrence, wound complications, and mesh infections. Quality of life was assessed using the Carolina's Comfort Scale. We performed a propensity score match. We initially had 2,920 open ventral hernia repairs. 1,539 of these received preperitoneal mesh, which we categorized down in order to standardize the mesh placement. 812 of these had a hernia defect size greater than 100 centimeters squared. 526 of these patients received component separation and the rest did not. Controlling for sex, BMI, defect size, and only looking at cases in CDC class one, we were able to generate 113 matched pairs. We initially examined anterior versus posterior component separation, as in the literature it is known that these are different. We found that there were differences in BMI, the defect size, and the overall length of stay. However, there were no differences within the wound complication rate, hernia recurrence, or mesh infection in this study. Because these two groups were similar, we felt comfortable grouping them together for a comparison versus patients without component separation. Baseline char patient characteristics show that our matched cohorts were equal on baseline characteristics. And this was similar within the operative details, as about 60% in both groups had recurrent hernias, paniculectomy was utilized about 30% of the time, and these defects were large at nearly 200 centimeters squared, uh, uh, and were reinforced with a large mesh almost 1,000 centimeters squared. Fascial closure was achieved in 98% of both cases, and a biologic mesh was utilized in 7 to 8%. We then compared the differences between component separation and no component separation. We found that those receiving a component separation had a higher pooled wound complication rate. However, there were no significant differences within each individual wound complication. They also had a higher rate of readmission, which was uh, mostly uh, related to the wound complications that they had. We did perform a multivariate analysis controlling uh, for paniculectomy, diabetes, and defect size to specifically look at wound complication, as these are known to influence wound complications. We found that component separation had an odds ratio of 2.27 in comparison to no component separation, as well as paniculectomy was individual, in, independently associated with wound complication with an odds ratio of 2.40. We then assessed quality of life utilizing the Carolina's Comfort Scale. This scale uh, surveys patients based on three symptoms, pain, mesh sensation, and movement limitations during eight different activities. We have utilized that any score greater than or equal to two on any of these questions is classified as a non-ideal quality of life. 
A score of two is classified as symptoms with minimal uh, uh, bothersome symptoms. These patients had high levels of preoperative pain, with 77% in both groups having preoperative pain and no difference between them. Post-op quali ideal quality of life did not show any differences between the component separation group and the no component separation group at both short-term and long-term follow-up. We did see that uh, post-op ideal quality of life continued to improve as time went on. In conclusion, component separation in this study was associated with increased wound complications, however had an extremely low recurrence rate. An overall quality of life was not affected by component separation, both within the short-term follow-up and the long-term follow-up. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.